I'm slinging hope out here when I'm walking with the cross. I toss bottles and baggies to every soul that is lost. I'm trying to reach the streets to the people you see. As low life, good for nothing, dope headed freaks. Nah, that ain't me, cause we one in the same. I lived in their shoes. I'm not gonna dwell too much on the, the things that happened to me when I was younger about the molestation and all that other stuff and because you know I do have some PTSD over all that stuff it set me up for the future to become what I became as far as the drugs and everything else and so you know because of what happened to me and all that once I got in seventh grade you know I, I grew up my dad worked at Goodyear um, my mom worked at Walmart Pharmacy. I had a good life. Everything was handed to me. And there's no reason, you know, if none of that stuff happened to me that I ever should have wild out. But because of the stuff that happened to me, once I got in seventh grade, I just gave up. I gave up on life, school, everything. So the my grades started slipping. Um, and it all went downhill from there. I think the first time I ever smoked a cigarette, I was 11, my, my grandmother had died, my step-grandmother, and I smoked a whole pack of her Misty Menthol 120s. And hanging out with buddies, I started, you know, dipping and around the same age. And just once I gave up at seventh grade, everything went downhill as far as I started trying everything so you know when I was 14 I was hanging out with some buddies and I smoked pot for the first time and didn't really thought I got high but I guess I did because we got to munchies and hit up a bunch of different you know restaurants in Fulton and you know after that you know I didn't have no way to have money besides what my parents gave me or I didn't have a job but you know I, I smoke weed and then I got introduced to pills and I would take pills and you know I was still in my father's pills because you know he's a bigger guy so he always had a uh, oil trans which is a synthetic opioid and then he got uh, prescribed you know lower tabs and oxycodone and stuff like that you know and uh, also he he got prescribed a uh, Clonopin, so you know I'd take as many as I could without getting caught and just from there it just it got bad once I got a job my first year of work I worked at um, Walmart I was 16 and I made $13,000 that year in 98 my parents paid all my insurance everything and so I spent $13,000 on drugs that year <laughs> Um, and I'm not laughing because that's sad, you know, it, it really is sad, but, you know, this, this played out every year forever, you know, because my parents always paid for everything, you know, I, I had a silver spoon in my mouth. Yeah, we were middle class, but, you know, I always had everything I wanted, four wheelers, cars, if I wrecked a car, they replaced a car, you know, and um, I was always against hard drugs, always against it always against it and then around 18 one of my buddies was like man you should try cocaine this is this is awesome and I was like no nah, man I don't do drugs you know I just smoke weed I did do drugs I just did you know the the I call them baby drugs because they ain't as bad you know just pop pills smoking weed you know stuff like that you know drink some alcohol but uh, the first time I did cocaine, I absolutely adored it. And that night, I snorted three and a half grams of cocaine very quickly. And whenever I'd have the extra money, I loved doing coke. I mean, that was, if I had $150 or whatever it was going for at the time, I'd go buy an eight ball and I would put it all in my face. and. You know, I'm not a big fan of uppers, but when I was 18, 17 maybe, I got prescribed Adderall, and I figured out amphetamines were, you know, pretty cool as far as if you wanted to be high. 
And so I get a 30 day script and in three days I would snort up all 30 of those up my nose while smoking weed just because those two together made a pretty good buzz. And you know, this was a cycle and it played out every day. And you know, my main staple was always marijuana, but I would do anything under the sun to catch a high. And um, as far as like naming off all the drugs I've done, I'm not gonna do that because it's just easier to name off the two I didn't do and that's heroin and PCP. Um, you know, throughout all of that, I was, I was searching. God's always been a humongous aspect of my life because I'm a church kid. I grew up in church, I grew up Pentecostal. Um, the church I went to, <laughs> probably gonna step on some toes. I just, it was, it was different. And instead of them showing me love and telling me about the love of Jesus, they told me every day I was going to hell. What well, in my heart of hearts and in my soul, I knew I was going to hell. You know, when I was at Fulton County, the school that I went to up until I failed 10th grade the third time, I got put in the Christian school and uh, they tried their best. It's just me and my buddy, <laughs> we were just, we were, we were hell on wheels. We were just really bad, bad kids. And so I remember this one time we were sitting there, it was a Wednesday and they always had this this Wednesday like service and they set up two tables and one was God's table and it had all this beautiful luscious fruit and just beautiful things on top of it and the other table was Satan's table and it had literally dude went out <laughs> and killed some animals found some road killed something and put guts and drew pentagrams and just all this nasty trash and all this stuff on there and it was aimed towards me and my buddy and the whole time they were preaching, they were looking at me and my friend and just basically just condemning us the whole time. And that affected me so deeply. And so when we went for lunch that day, they had made up plates and said that's what we had to eat that day. And I threw it at them, I lost my temper, you know. I just, I, I went insane cussed them out and just lost my cool because I'm like, I'm not eating that, y'all are crazy. Like, y'all think I'm crazy, y'all are crazy. And uh, they picked all that stuff up and set it on top of my cubicle and told me it had to sit there the rest of that day. And I went just bat crap crazy and just lost it. And that was the catalyst for us leaving that church, you know, and basically at that point in time, the majority of my family left that church because of that incident. And, uh, you know, the people that are over this church now are my family, you know, and I love them. And, you know, I don't hold no grudges against them for any of that that happened, but that shaped me so, so much because for a kid that's just rebellious and you know, is looking for, you know, we're all looking for Jesus. We just don't know it. You know, most people just don't know what they're looking for. That shaped me and hurt me and just, it just affected me so much. And just that whole experience, you know, and uh, I was a bad kid. You know, the reason why they drew pentagrams and stuff on there is because I went and got satanic books from the library just so I could rile them up. I love I love getting under people's skin and so like I was going around tagging up the church with pentagrams and you know all these other things that I knew would just upset them so you know I'm I'm very much to blame and all that you know too but uh you know I forgive them I forgive them um but it, it did it, it it shaped me in a way that you know shouldn't have ever happened you know love would have definitely won out in that situation versus condemning me you know 
I would have done much better if they'd have followed that all up with, you know, Jesus loves you and we love you and all this, but they didn't, you know, and maybe they just didn't know how to deal with somebody that was as rebellious as me. And I, you know, I don't blame them. I forgive them. It's just that, that screwed me up mentally as far as, you know, being a Christian um, at that young age. I just, I, I rebelled so hard because I'm like, these are church people you know, the leadership of this church is telling me I, no matter what I do, I'm going to hell, basically, is what I thought at that time. And, you know, it's taken up until, you know, in my 30s for me to grasp, you know, what God, you know, really meant with, you know, love and grace and all this other stuff. Like, it, it took me a long time to 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 rewire that part of my brain to know that God, you know, does love me and I'm going to fall and that, you know, um, I'm not going to hell as long as I'm doing what I'm supposed to. We'll get into my adult years, you know, from 18 till, you know, I got sober for the first time. Besides heroin and PCP, there wasn't a drug that I didn't touch, that I didn't love, that I didn't do religiously whenever I had the money. If I didn't have the money, I'd steal from you. I never really had to rob anybody because I was just so good at stealing, but I was a hustler, so I could always come up with the money. And so I was very promiscuous. Um, I think in a three county area, I slept with every girl that, you know, would let me do so. And uh, I was always just about women and drugs. And because those two were the most satisfying things, you know, for me at the time. And like I said, I, I've stated, you know, God was always nudging me. The Holy Spirit was always there, just nudge me and nudge me like, boy, you're messing up. Come back, come back. When I was 15, it was prophesied over me. This um, African-American gentleman came to the church and prophesied that I would reach thousands of people for Jesus, you know. And I always thought that guy was crazy. And then I've had numerous other preachers just not know me from Adam come up to me and just get near me and be like, whoa, like, you're going to do wonderful things for God and you're going to reach so many souls for Jesus. And, you know, in the back of my head, I always, you know, wanted that, you know, but my life wasn't lining up. And, uh, you know, so there'd be time periods where I'd, I'd get sober for a little bit, but, it, you know, it never stuck. But, you know, at 15, I, I knew I was called to preach. I know without a shadow of a doubt, you know, that's where my life was going to be leading. And uh, I just always ran. I ran and I ran and I did drugs so I didn't have to, you know, feel all that, you know, that came with God. And I didn't, I, you know, I wanted to be numb to everything that happened in my past. And, you know, I was very hard headed, rebellious, and I ran. And with the drugs, that's the whole reason I did drugs, because I didn't want to feel feelings. I mean, who wants to feel horrible all the time? And I did. I felt horrible from just my being a kid experiences, being a teenager experiences, my dad experiences. Like, I mean, everything. I just wanted to be numb, and drugs did that for me. And so I was <laughs> very promiscuous. Like, that was a goal for me. Every day of every week was to find a new girl to sleep with. And I accomplished that on every level imaginable. And um, <laughs> when I met my wife at Walmart, the main goal was, you know, the latter. But my mom always told me that once I met the right person, I would know. So the first night we hung out, I was stoned out of my mind. And uh, we went to a field 
and I thought I was, you know, things were going to go a different route. They did not. And we just talked, but I told her that night that I was going to marry her. And she thought I was insane. And back then, you know, I probably was insane. But, uh, you know, we got married. I'd been in trouble with the law before. Um, you know, just minor things. But when we got married, I, t I told her I'd, I'd quit doing the drugs. That was a lie. I, I kept on doing them. Um, I was 20 three when we got married she was 19 we were both really young I was just tired of running around you know messing with women and I wanted to you know stick with one and uh, you know it's crazy because seven months later after we started dating we were married and then it wasn't a month later I got busted at Walmart for stealing I was always stealing always stealing and so they had this drawer up under the desk at Walmart that had credit cards and wallets and just everything you think of, cell phones, all this other stuff. And I'd, I'd dip into it all the time. I told them, don't put me up there by that money and I meant it because I knew what was going to happen. And so people would come in there and I'd sell them a PlayStation for 50 bucks, you know, under the table, go outside, get 50 more dollars. And, you know, that's how I fund my drug habit for a little bit. And, but stealing these credit cards and getting rid of those and you know forging checks and you know stuff like that was just a main staple one day i was walking out of walmart and my huge mug of sack of weed got tangled up in my keys and when i pulled my keys out the weed hit the ground the security guy just happened to be walking in and we was about two foot away from each other and i looked down at the sack of weed he looked at the sack of weed and i snatched it up took off running God has just always been a, a constant thing. So I got sober for 18 months. Around probably, let's see, when was it? Probably 2009 ish, 2010 maybe. And a boy that lived behind us said, Why don't you try volunteering at a fire department? Because he was on a fire department. And I was like, Man, they're not going to do that. You know, I've been in trouble got all these tattoos on it. I ain't look what they're looking for but I did I volunteered and for 18 months I stayed sober just because of the fire service and you know that turned into a job very quickly I rose up through the ranks became lieutenant and it was amazing you know and then my wife got pregnant um, we had another son, uh, Aiden, which that was before the fire department thing, but she got pregnant again around 2011, 2000, yeah, probably 2011, and uh, she miscarried. And she swears up and down, that's not the reason why I relapsed, but, you know, I know it was around the same time period, and... I just, I've never been able to deal with anybody's feelings, no less my own. And so I relapsed, I started smoking weed and just that one joint set it off. I mean, I started smoking meth in the bathroom of the fire department. I was, you know, just doing a bunch of stupid things. And uh, they popped a drug test on me at the fire department after a long time after me being able to, you know, pass all these drug tests by, you know, using fake urine. And uh, that day I just couldn't get the urine warmed up. And, you know, hindsight being 2020, I could have ran over there and used the microwave for 10 seconds and been golden, but that ain't what happened. I was just so high that day, I just, my world fell apart because after I'd used the urine, it wasn't up to temperature. The guy said I had to use, you know, pee again, and I wasn't going to do that because I had a plethora of drugs in my system that I didn't want anybody to know about, and so I just left. I quit, I quit. and I was just so down and depressed, and I stayed in that drug use up until March 1st, 2015. I just went right back to it because I didn't have anything. You know, God was dealing with me throughout all this. And 
March 1st, 2015, on the way to work at Rural King, I was a gun apartment manager. I was stoned, but God and the Holy Spirit was wooing me, and I just, I knew that uh, it was time to give it up, and so I asked God, if you take it away from me, which I'd done a billion times over, that I won't go back to it. And so that day I got sober. Six months later, a job came up at Union City Fire Department. And because of that, my manager was like, you know, you don't want to work rural, rural king for the rest of your life. Why don't you try going, you know, and getting this job at Union City? And I was like, I'm not what that city wants or needs. And, uh, but I was prayed up. I was so right with God. I was on fire. I was preaching to people back there at the Rural King Counter. Like, I mean, just, just so on fire. And, uh, you know, this was the present, this was the thing throughout my whole life. I was always preaching to people, even if I was high, you know, I just, Jesus was always coming up. And so I told that lady, I'm going to try for it. I talked to my wife and she said, go for it. And so, out of 40 people that, they were, that were trying out, they were hiring four. I got hired first. And uh, I'm there till this day. I just left there this morning. And, you know, I still struggle with, you know, trying to be a, uh, I've only been a productive citizen for six years. So it's very hard you know i'm not doing criminal acts but it's just hard for me to walk that you know line of being a a good citizen just because you know when things go wrong in my life it's very easy for me to think you know the criminal aspect of things you know and so it's hard for me to toe that line and uh but the fire department helps me do so so um but yeah i i go through droughts I go through periods where I want to take life into my own hands and, you know, um, it's, it's very easy to get in those ruts if I don't wake up every day and make the choice to give my life to God and let Him rule it and Him be in control. There's one last thing I want to tell y'all. And I could have went on fires about things that have went on in my life, but this is very important, and I need people to know. A couple of years ago, I thought I was unhappy with my life and my wife, and I let the devil get in my ear and tell me I wasn't happy. And, you know, me and my wife were arguing all the time. And, you know, I just, in my head, I thought it'd be easier most of the time just to leave and um, just get a divorce and going about our own ways. But, you know, I do have conviction, convictions on that end. But, uh, you know, <laughs> this girl came along through Facebook, we started talking. I know her from back in the day. She's beautiful. She's everything that I thought that I needed at that point in time. And it started off very easy is going as far as like nothing was going on um i'd let my wife know after a couple of weeks that i'd maybe went a little too far with talking to this girl because i do have convictions and you know god was dealing with me on that and so i quit talking to her for about a week and then I pick back up and then every time I pick it back up it go a little further and it go a little further and then I tell my wife and the whole time you know my wife 
I didn't really understand how close my wife was to God because we just didn't really talk about things like that. You know, I knew she believed in God and I knew she was always at church and, you know, I just didn't know how close she was to God. And, uh, you know, through all this, I was honest, you know, as much as I could be. And it was six months into me talking to this girl, you know, I'd meet up with her, I'd, I'd kiss her, I'd do things that I shouldn't be doing, but I didn't have sex with her because I really thought I was going to leave my wife and be with this girl, just basically up and switch families. And, uh, you know, it's wrong, it's wrong all the way around. And uh, I guess I was going through a midlife crisis because I bought a Harley that year too. So, like, I just, you know, I was going from one extreme to the other, just, you know, thinking this is what I need in my life. And, you know, I didn't sleep with her, sleep with her until about six months in because I just, I was so twisted up because I didn't want to leave my kids. I, I didn't want to hurt my wife. I didn't want to hurt this girl because I had done caught some feelings. But I thought I had to do that to figure out what, you know, I was going to make, you know, a decision. And I thought I had to do that. Well, it turns out, and I'm not going too deep into all that stuff because, you know, I don't know who's going to end up watching this video. But for six months, you, it, it took about six months for me to, you know, finally agree to sleep with her. And, uh, you know, God was dealing with me the whole time and, you know, things that should have been easy for a man to be able to do were not easy for me because God was trying to get my attention, like wholeheartedly. And, uh, I kind of didn't like what God was doing, so I took it upon myself to make sure everything would work out on that end. And we did end up sleeping together. And during that time period, it lasted about a year off and on. And I only slept with her three times, and uh, which is horrible. It's horrible. You know, I, I never should have done that. But I was honest with my wife, you know, as much as I could be telling her these things and the whole time I'm like Kelly you got to take the kids you got to take my money you got to leave me what is wrong with you and she's like God's gonna work this out and I'm like are you insane what what is happening why are you not leaving me and she said God's gonna work this out and I'm like I just I don't get it I don't understand what is happening because why would you stay with me knowing I'm doing this and that I'm probably not going to stop doing this? And she says, because God's telling me this is going to work out. And so I don't know if y'all have ever read the Bible, but the part of, I'm going to say this wrong probably, but Hosea and Gomer in the Bible, where God shows his love through because I think it was Gomer went off, she was a prostitute, and she left him and went back to prostituting. And, you know, God was trying to show the love for Israel through all this stuff and told Homer to go find her and make her his wife again and bring her back. And, you know, it showed God's love through that whole situation, you know, God's love for Israel and all this stuff. And so basically that whole situation played out in my life. I got to see God's love for me through the actions of my wife. And we're still together to this day. We are stronger than we've ever been. God has showed out on that end. Now I'm a rough person to deal with, you know, but she loves me wholeheartedly. She loves me and she should have took me and for everything I had. But she trusted God. 
through that situation. And it just blows my mind. I mean, dude, I was so broken, so broken, because I was like, God, how could you, how could you love me this much? How could you let, you know, Kelly stay with me through all this when she should have, you know, took me to the bank and, you know, took the kids and would have been justified in doing it, you know? And throughout all that, I was the biggest, loudest voice saying, you got to go. Like, you got to, you, you got to leave me because... I just, I was, I was twisted up and I didn't, you know, want to put her through it no more. And I guess I was trying to take the easy way out and make her leave instead of me doing it. And I thank God every day she didn't, you know, I love my wife. To me, she is the most beautiful person inside and out. And I love her. We've been together for 15 years and I put her through more in 15 years than most people have to go through in a lifetime. I've actually put her through more in the first year of marriage than most people have to go through in a lifetime because I'm hard headed and I was twisted up in drugs and just all that other stuff. But she didn't deserve to get cheated on. And, you know, I believe God's put me through, let me walk through things in life for specific reasons. And I believe now since I'm preaching, you know, there's nothing I haven't done. There's nothing on this earth that I've not done willingly and had to ask for forgiveness for and for God brought me out on the other side of it, you know, basically unscathed because that's how I know that God's got a calling on my life because I should have been dead a billion times over, should have been in jail a billion times over. I should have been, you know, living in a box somewhere down by the river because just of all my stupid actions and God loves me and you know sometimes you know it just it blows my mind that there's a God out there that created all of this all of this and he loved me enough to send his son to die on a cross for my sins so I can be in right relationship with him and why would the creator of the universe care so much about me you know, and had these plans for me. And I mean, it just blows my mind. And I mean, it's absolutely just insane that he loves me that much. The fire department keeps me, keeps me in line, but Jesus more than anything keeps me in line. You know, and I, I've struggled. I, I've struggled, you know, trying to be a good Christian and doing what I want to do. Being a man, it's really hard to give up that control. So in 2018, God told me to build a cross. It might've actually been before that. I just, 2018, I remember having the cross built. So it was somewhere around there. God told me to build this cross and walk with it, and which to me wasn't weird because I've known people that have done that. And uh, so I built this cross and I let it set and set beside my uh, shed out there because I just was like, this is crazy, I'm not doing that. And so in 2018, I started walking with this cross, this, this 14 foot cross with a wheel on it that I spray painted Jesus saves on one side. Might have wrote it on there with a marker. And the other side says, um, I'm not ashamed. And so the day that I went to walk with that cross, I'd walk by it and I audibly heard God say, pick this up and walk with it. And I was like, this is crazy, dude. Like, why would you want me, why? And he said, just walk with it. I said, all right, God, if this is what you want me to do, let me talk to one person, reach one person, and I'll do it. And so I picked up the cross, my son walked with me, and we walked a couple of blocks, ran into the first person. It was this drunk African-American guy. I'll never forget it, he was riding a bicycle, had like a 12-pack hanging on his handlebar. Well, we talked about God, and he was receptive to it. And I was like, okay. So I was like, all right, all right, God. So we kept on going. Then I walked up and met a businessman. 
And that guy said he was a Christian, but I still, I, I was like, I'm going to pray with the next person. So he was the next person I walked up to. And so I prayed with him and uh, I kept on walking. And then in that time period, we walked up on seven different people, told them the gospel, told them a little bit about my testimony. And it was just, it was amazing. So we get to, to Main and First Street in Union City and my son says, I'm thirsty. And I said, boy, we're almost back to the house. We ain't going to the grocery store or the, the gas station that's right down the road. I said, well, you'll get a drink when we make it to the house. We maybe made it a block. And this lady at this restaurant that closes early, it was about two o'clock. She was standing outside fixing to walk in. And she said, y'all look thirsty. Come inside and get a drink. And I hit my son and I was like, man, that is God. And so we get in there and her son was a drug addict. And, you know, me being, you know, drug addict all those years, I, that's who I have a heart for. And we got to talking and we prayed and I got her son's phone number. And it was just, it was an amazing experience. When we got back to the house, I was like, this is totally what God wants me to do. And so since then, I've walked with a cross numerous times. I've talked to numerous people. I've been to different cities around Kentucky and Tennessee. And every time I step out of that vehicle, I pray, God, just let me talk to one person. And it always ends up being more than that. Just recently, when I walked, it was snowing. And I was like, there's no way nobody's going to be outside. But I talked to more people that day than I've ever talked on the beautifulest, most pretty day in the world. So I know that's one of the things that, you know, God called me to do. And then also somewhere along the way, since I'm a, you know, ex-drug addict and God's delivered me from that, God told me to bag up these little video Bibles and I have some of my motorcycle sitting over there. And it's literally just a little Bible keychain Bible that they used to pass out at like vacation Bible school and I, I tie it up like a little dope sack and I go around and I give them to people that I know or drug addicts or pretty much anybody really and I tell them hope's not found in a baggie it's found in Jesus and so one of my sayings is you know slinging hope and uh, it says slinging dope but the H is over the D so it's slinging hope because I used to sell a lot of drugs to fund my habit. And uh, so now I'm a hope dealer. And uh, was just, I didn't coin this word. This has been a thing for a long time. Uh, but I do use it because it, it explains a lot. And uh, <laughs> last year, my buddy Chance McFarlane that I went to school with, who was the knucklehead that uh was there with me that caused so much trouble got a hold of me and i ain't talked to him in years and he was rapping secular music and i've always used poems and you know always thought it'd be cool to rap but you know i just never thought that was on my plate he got a hold of me may of last year and he said we're gonna rap christian music and i was like you are insane <laughs> and um it's just it's amazing how God works, you know. God does things that just blows my mind sometimes. And so him saying, you know, we're going to rap, I thought he meant going to his house and doing like we used to do old school, doing cassette tapes, you know, maybe something cool and newer. But that turned into us going to the biggest studio in Paducah and actually having an engineer and... Now I'm a Christian rap artist and, you know, I ain't blew up yet. I don't want to blow up. I want Jesus to blow up. I don't want to be famous. I know what could happen if I became famous, but I do want to get Jesus out there. And it's the same thing with crosswalking, slinging hope, all of it. I want people to know Jesus. I don't care if my name's ever remembered for anything. I think it'd be cool to be remembered as a firefighter because I've gave so much of my life to that. But other than that, you know, on the God end of things, I want people 
I'm representing Jesus and everything, and I want people to know Jesus, and I want to win as many souls as I can for Jesus, and that's it, because that is my reason for being here on earth, is to tell people about the gospel and the greatest gift, the greatest free gift, you know, that's for everybody. And so it's just, it's amazing the things that have taken place, and just here recently, and I'm talking about recently, very recently. I went and preached two weeks ago at this church at Calvert City. And I thought I was just there to preach. And so I gave a hybrid my testimony and then went into the Great Commission because that's where my life has went. And I got a phone call two days ago from one of the you know elders in the church and he said he'd look me up on uh and watch the watch the video of me giving the testimony and preaching he said you know i fell in love with you he said i got to looking through your facebook page and all i post is about jesus i don't put anything else on there because for me that's just a ministry tool and uh so he said i was going through your stuff he said, I seen your rap, I seen all this stuff. And this is an older gentleman and kind of blew my mind that, you know, he was cool about the rap and everything. But like, he said, I would like for you to, you know, consider coming here and being the preacher. And I was like, <laughs> hey, hold on, wait, like, you know, all right. Um, okay. Uh, can I think about this? You know, can I, can I pray on it? You know? And, you know, we've been in between churches, you know, um, trying to figure out where God's leading us. And uh, I called my wife. I called some preachers. I called some friends that I totally trust. And, you know, I prayed. And, I, you know, I've been praying about where God's leading me. But I prayed and I inst instantaneously heard God say, you know, do this. And... Uh, I don't believe in coincidences and you know I, I know since I was called to preach at 15 ultimately this is where my life was leading me and I told one of my closest friends not even a week ago I'm never gonna be a pastor that's not what God wants <laughs> don't say stuff like that because apparently I don't know what God wants because this you know kind of blew my mind as far as you know i never would have thought this would have ever been a thing you know especially you know at this stage in my life but you know i'm a willing vessel if god tells me to go i go if god tells me to jump i say hi hi before he even tells me something i'm already in my mind i've made it up my mind it's it's yes i'm going to do what god tells me to do you know do i want to go to china if that ever came up no but if god told me to go to china would i do it wholeheartedly so I just I'm still trying to wrap my head around this this last part because I didn't think at this point you know in my life this would be a thing but it's definitely a thing and it's, it's going to happen and so I'm excited I'm not nervous because my God is in control he's always going to be in control and you know I want to please God in everything I do. And if God wants me to be a preacher and rap Christian music and sling hope and crosswalk, I'm gonna do all those things until he tells me to stop and do something different, you know, because ultimately my life is about pleasing God and following Jesus. And I will do those things no matter what. And you know, the way this world's going, you know, it's, it's getting crazier by the day, you know, and I've talked to friends about, you know, what if, you know, it ends up we have to become martyrs for Jesus. I would gladly give up my life. You know, I've not ever been put in that position, but I know at that time, if it ever comes, I know the Holy Spirit will give me what I need to, you know, do whatever I have to do at that point in time. And even if I had to die for my faith, I'm, I'm willing for that. That's how much I believe in Jesus and what I'm doing. And uh, God's showing up and showing out my life just every which way. 
And if he can do this for me, I mean, he can do it for you. I'm nobody special. I'm nobody, you know. In God's eyes, I'm somebody, but in everybody else's eyes, I mean, I'm nothing. I'm just, you know, I'm just a firefighter. I'm just a EMT, you know, but God's had a plan for my life this whole time. And, you know, it just, sometimes I don't understand the things that are going on. And, but I'm okay with that because God knows best. And I don't, I've, I've proven that. You know, when I do things my own way, I, I dig ruts and it's hard for me to get out of it. It's easier if I just go along with what God says because my life goes, I wouldn't say easier, it's, it's a little smoother. But, you know, to me, being a Christian is the hardest thing I've ever done. And that's just me personally. You know, I know for some people it's easier. But for me, it's hard because I've lived life so long the other way that it's hard to want to give up that control and do things, do things God's way. And, uh, but ultimately, I will always do that. So if he can change my life around and make me a firefighter and an AMT full time and, you know, give me the opportunity to be a preacher now and, you know, give me the wisdom to crosswalk and sling hope and, you know, reach souls for Jesus, you know, man, what, what more abundant things can he do in your life, you know, because God's for you. No matter what, God is for you. He's always going to be for you, and he wants you to have that relationship, and it, it just, it blows my mind that this whole world is searching. Everybody's searching for something. But what you were searching for is the same thing I was searching for all those years that it took me forever to figure out. It's Jesus. It's always going to be Jesus. There's, there's nothing else. It's, it's Jesus. It's Jesus Christ, and it's that relationship. And you can try to fill up this hole that we have inside of all of us with anything you want to. But until you fill it up with what it's meant to be felt, filled up with, and that's that relationship you're you'll never be satisfied so if i can stress anything to you if you not tried jesus try jesus because what do you got to lose you, you actually have a lot to heaven and hell i mean it's eternity but even here on earth i mean it's just so easy to just ask god into your you know jesus into your life and once you do, the Holy Spirit will start making the changes that you need to, to become a better Christian, a better person. And uh, I'm telling you, that's what we're all searching for. And we all need that. We all need that. But I guarantee you, and I know for a fact, that He loves you just as much as He loves me. He wants to do greater things in your life than what you got going on. But God's for you and he loves you and um we wanted to make this video because i i do believe that testimonies are powerful and you know i want jesus to be the forefront of everything i do and i hope this video somehow touches you um and maybe it can you know reach the masses and show people you don't have to walk down the the road that i did that's rough that's just bumpy because i've done everything wrong and god has blessed me and allowed me to you know come out on the other side of it and if you could take anything away from what i'm saying listen to the stuff that i've done wrong and then try to emulate the stuff I've done right, you know, the, the Jesus things, because I made my life rough and hard and just bad decision after bad decision. And because of God's hand on my life, you know, I'm at the point now to where God is showing out and showing up and just, just tremendously just, uh, 
just working things out for my good and he will do it for you too and uh I love God, I love y'all, and I hope this somehow touches you, reaches you, and uh, just know that the Holy Spirit will woo you and change you if you decide to give your heart to Jesus, not your heart, your life, your life, you know, the heart is deceitful above all things, and so give your life to Jesus and the Holy Spirit will transform you and Jesus will change your life around and I mean it will be the greatest thing in the world so God bless y'all I'm gonna quit talking and God loves you I love you and amen <laughs>